Uh, next, we have Ghazala Wahab, who's going to uh, give us the keynote address, a brief introduction about uh, Ghazala. Ghazala Wahab started a uh, force in August 2003 along with uh, Praveen Swani. Apart from writing on issues like homeland security, terrorism, Jammu and Kashmir, left-wing extremism and religious extre uh, extremism, she is the author of the best-selling book that we just mentioned, Born a Muslim. I'd like to welcome Ghazala Wahab. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and uh, I have to express my uh, deep gratitude to CDPP and Amir for really uh, recognizing the book and promoting it to the extent that I'm here today. Uh, I have written a few things which I wanted to read out and uh, I hope you don't mind if I cons constantly refer to what I have written. And because age has caught up with me, so I have to wear my reading glasses as well. <laughs> so um, I have largely been a self-contained person in my life. I have frequently uh, sought and uh, followed my own advice. Uh, I have no illusions of being a thinker or a philosopher. But the fact is that when you spend most of your time with your own self, you occasionally run out of conversational ideas and subjects. Hence, reading and thinking becomes your default pastime. And I have been doing that since my childhood, interspersed with daydreaming, all of which was hugely entertaining and enriching. I strongly recommend everyone to spend at least some time every day with, in one's own company. Not only will you start to value yourself and your ideas, you will also realize that aloneness is deeply calming. I know many of you would be thinking that I am talking from a position of privilege. You are only partly correct. My privilege didn't come from the money or the physical space available to me to indulge in solitary reminiscences. I won't bore you with the details of my childhood. They are mentioned in my book, Born a Muslim, in great detail. Uh, the introduction of which was just released here, courtesy. I mean, my privilege came from understanding fairly early in life that self self love is not vanity, but a fortification against whatever life throws at you. Jigar Muradabadi said, "Unse milne ko kya kahiye jigar? Khud se milne ko zamana chahiye." Not true. Khud se milna is not difficult at all, because you are with yourself all the time. You only need to value it and give yourself the respect you deserve by talking to yourself, by listening to yourself. If you are mindful, you will have all the time to do that. While cooking, cleaning, bathing, commuting, to work, to college, to school, wherever. I always had a great time walking to my college from the bus stop. I didn't wait for my classmates to arrive at the bus stop, as some did, so that they could walk while chatting. I would, in any case, be chatting with them during the day, in between and after the classes. So why not spend some quality time with myself, complaining, cribbing, planning, imagining, fantasizing, the possibilities were endless. By now you would have realized that I have no expertise nor competence to deliver a keynote address. The best that I can do is share my experiences or what I have encapsulated as five life lessons. The first lesson that I learned fairly early was financial independence. This is a no brainer yet it needs as many right reiterations as possible. When I turned 16, my father gave me an add-on credit card. I was super excited. A credit card represented financial freedom, but it took me only a few months to realize that far from freedom, the credit card was a mechanism for bondage. In the garb of freedom, it was making me even more dependent upon my father. My father's financial indulgence not only put limits to my actions, but thoughts too. By knowing what I was buying, he knew what I was thinking or not thinking. 
I always wanted to be a journalist, but the credit card gave me the clarity that I wanted to earn money, my own money, that journalism was not going to be my passion or a hobby, but a career, that I had to earn money from journalism. The day I got my first salary, I stopped using my father's money, that I was right in assessing the danger of my father's credit card was proved within a few months of my working. In one of his outbursts, he was uh, vociferously against me working. So in one of his outbursts, my father told me that I could work if I was so determined, but I must refuse to accept the salary, that he will give me whatever money I desired every month. He must be my provider, else he would be mocked in the society. I understood where my father was coming from. My closest friend, an interior designer and not a Muslim, was facing the same dilemma. Her father, who was extremely proud of her talent, got her the first client, an old business associate of his. Once the designing project was complete, she raised the bill. The father's friend had a fit. He promptly told her father how shocked he was that his daughter had raised a bill. My father's friend was livid. He had not realized that his daughter was seeking a career, not a hobby. No matter how indulgent your parents are, how generous your brothers are, or how rich your husband is, unless you earn your money, you will have no control over your life. The same argument goes if your family is conservative and restricts your movement. Financial independence is one battle we all must fight all the time and fight to win. It does not matter if eventually you spend all your earnings on your family out of financial compulsions, coercion, or love. Your ability to earn will make you confident and will go a long way in ensuring that you don't make petty compromises with your life and liberty. The second lesson that I learned, another no-brainer, was education and learning, and to learn to distinguish between the two. Education is what we learn in a formal setup in schools and universities and colleges. Learning is what you do by yourself through reading and reflecting upon what you read and contextualizing what you have read to your environment, to your experiences. We all know, and we are in a university right now, that our formal education system <coughs> caters to the lowest common denominator. To increase, to make it broad-based, we have actually dumbified our educational system, our material, our syllabi, which we teach. We are not teaching or we are not gearing to make people thinkers or people who could be independent in their approach. We are educating them on an assembly line so they can fit the pattern the society has created. So it is important to broaden your perspective, to enhance your skills, to ensure that your education is not in vain is not a waiting room for marriage. I personally know several Muslim women who continue to study as they waited to get married. Since it was difficult to find Muslim men who could match the educational qualifications of these women, their education was undermined, devalued as, of, as something of no consequence. I am not undermining women who choose not to have a career. My emphasis is on choice. Not only must you be aware of the options before you, and the choices you make, you must also have the courage to stand by the choice you make. That is where education is different from learning. Academics is important, but equally important is opening up of one's mind and broadening of one's perspective. Hence, learn about the world, about your place in the world, and what could be your contribution to the world. Learning will take you to the next lesson on my list, asking questions. A lot of times we remain in doubt or do things without being convinced because we have been tutored to follow instructions without questioning them, especially religious instructions. When I was growing up, my mother frequently employed religion to discipline us. Random misdemeanors were referred to as sin to ensure that we did not do them. However, with time, I started to question the validity of the instructions. My mother stonewalled my questions by telling me, ye likhi hui baat hai. It's written in the book. Which book? Nobody knew. I continued to question 
and gradually got in the habit of seeking the answers to my questions on my own. In my family, I am known as a person who asks too many questions and not many members of my family like that. But in my defense, if I had not asked so many questions on the practice of Islam in India, I would have not have realized that most of what we follow comes not from the Quran, but from the ancillary texts written by various scholars centuries after the death of the Prophet. I would not have found out that Islam actually is the most feminist religion ever, that the rights that Muslim women enjoy come from the Quran and the restrictions imposed upon their person comes from the texts written by men centuries later, that a large number of male Muslim scholars have done the greatest disservice to the Muslims and not just Muslim women because of their patriarchal, parochial and bigoted outlook. That the cross of intolerance that most Muslims carry has been forced upon them by fellow Muslims who used Islam as a cover up for their narrow mindedness. So sisters in faith, raise your hands and ask questions always and every single time somebody tells you what to do. Honestly, what appears wrong is usually wrong. Smart compromises. That's the fourth lesson I learned. And this follows from the last lesson. Jaan hai to jahan hai. Preserve yourself and conserve your energy. I will use the recent example to illustrate what I mean. The hijab business in Karnataka. I have been viciously trolled for this on social media. I have been accused of throwing Muslim women under the bus on this issue. Well-known and well-regarded people have publicly told me to shut up. But as is evident, I have not shut up because I speak from conviction. Whatever be my view on the injunctions of hijab in Islam, and I have dwelled on this in my book, the UDP issue from day one was not about religion, but politics. The wannabe Muslim politicians overplayed their hand and instead of making a tactical retreat, continued to fight, hiding behind school and college going girls and women, using them as human shields. I have nothing against Muslims indulging in politics. In a democracy, it is their right. I have nothing against women asserting their religious and political rights. They must do that but not at the cost of their future. Once again, an example from my life. Until class eight, I studied in a convent school. My school uniform is stipulated that my skirt be two inches above my knees. For some reason, my mother determined that it was against Islam and my skirt should be eight inches below my knees, effectively touching my ankles, where after my socks and the shoes would do the covering up. The nuns did not take kindly to my mother's attempts at modesty that she was forcing upon me. I was pulled out in uh, the assembly repeatedly and warned. My mother refused to give up. In a few days, I realized that I was facing a serious threat of being the collateral damage in this battle of nerves between my mother and the nuns. My priority was education and the possibility it helped for me to realize my dreams. So I made my first smart compromise. I rolled up my skirt at the waist under my belt before going for the assembly, keeping the nuns happy. At the end of the school day, before getting in the car to come back home, I used to pull it down to my ankles. The only harm this caused was to my appearance. I looked ungainly and strange, but that was a small price to pay. So don't dig your heels and your own graves on issues that can be navigated smartly. Remember, it is not about your rights. If somebody is telling you that it is about your rights, do not let others have agency over your bodies or your minds. And the last lesson is, life may be a challenge and a struggle, but it is not a series of battles. This is the most important lesson that I have learned in my life. Do not always be in a fighting mode. If fighting is inevitable, hold out, bide your time. Fight smart and from a position of strength. Fighting is exhausting. If you waste your time and energy on petty fights, you won't have any left for the big ones. And what are the big ones for Muslim women? Everything. And most of them have nothing to do with Islam or your religion, 
they only have to do with your gender. Remember, in most parts of the world, a woman's body is a repository of her family's honor and the religious diktats. Your battle starts there. The right to your own body. Thereafter, you have to constantly maneuver your way through family compulsions, educational discrimination, workplace sexism. And all along the way, you have to keep the mullahs, if you're a Muslim, snapping at your heels with fatwas and religious diktats at bay. It may all appear too much to bear in a lifetime. But we are neither the first ones to do that, nor we are the last ones. Like in a relay, before women before us have carried this torch, and women after us will carry it. Our only responsibility is to ensure that it keeps burning with our life breath, if required. Thank you so much.